Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. In the process of preparing my video on creating your own band reject filter using a shorted stub, I realized that there were certain skills that would be helpful as a prerequisite to that whole process. And one such skill is measuring the values of things like capacitors and inductors to use as terminations to the stubs. So I decided to postpone the completion of that video to show you how to measure these types of components. In this video, I will be using a nano VNA to measure the values of some capacitors and inductors. I will show you some things to be careful of. Lastly, I will attempt to measure the value of an unknown impedance, a capacitor, and an inductor using my antenna analyzer and then compare these results with those from the VNA. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. We need to begin with talking setup. Measuring actual component values accurately can be a pretty tricky business because there's all kinds of stray things going on. Anytime you have two conductors in proximity to each other with some kind of insulating material in between like air or plastic, well, you now have a capacitor. Stray capacitance. Any wire is an inductor regardless of the size and length of it. And we have to use some sort of means to connect the component to the test instrument. I mean, I had a one quarter inch or 6.4 millimeter piece of 16 gauge wire soldered across an end connector. A dead short, right? <laughs> Not actually. It was a nine nanohenry inductor. We have stray inductance. So how significant are these strays to our measurements? Well, it depends on several factors. How precise of a measurement are you trying to perform? How large are these stray values? And how small is the value of the component that we're measuring as compared to these stray values? In our measurements, we have to be sure that we're measuring the component itself and somehow ignoring all of this stray stuff. And there is one way to accomplish this. We use a Vector Network Analyzer, or VNA. To begin with, I want to answer the question, why a VNA? Well, every connector has capacitance and inductance associated with it. According to transmission line theory, the impedance presented at one end of a piece of coax is not necessarily the same as what's found at the other end of the piece of coax. This depends on frequency, and the physical and electrical characteristics of the coax. So anything that we place between the measurement instrument and the impedance or the capacitor or the inductor that we're measuring will cause that measurement to be wrong to one degree or another. Well, what if we could take all of these things into consideration so that the value we measure is actually the value that exists there? This is where the Vector Network Analyzer, or VNA, comes in. VNAs used to be very, very expensive, costing tens of thousands of dollars, and often it was a two-man lift. This has all changed with the Mini VNA Tiny, the Nano VNA, and similar devices. These newer, smaller VNAs are relatively inexpensive, highly available, and do an amazing job when used right. One of the steps that we must follow for accurate measurements is calibration. Now, when we go through the calibration procedure with our Nano VNA, it measures all this stuff that may lay between the VNA itself and the thing to be measured. This includes all of this stray stuff. Then, when we make the actual measurement, it takes all of this stuff into consideration and provides a real value for the component. So how do we connect to our component? Our first step in getting ready to make our measurements is to determine what we are measuring and what cables, adapters, or fixtures we might need to make the measurement. 
If I'm measuring loose components, then I might need something like this handy dandy little fixture here. If my component is mounted on a connector like this one happens to be, then what sort of adapters will I need to connect my nano VNA to the thing being tested? Well, the next thing we have to think about is the frequency that we're going to use to make our measurement. If we are measuring individual components and all we want to know is their particular value, then we would likely want to perform this measurement at as low a frequency as possible in order to avoid the effects of parasitic stuff and the associated self-resonance of the component. Well, what is self-resonance? Well, a real capacitor is actually an ideal capacitor with some parasitic inductance and some resistance in there as well. When the capacitive reactance of the ideal capacitor is equal to the inductive reactance of the parasitic inductance, then we have a resonance circuit. As we approach the frequency where this occurs, the measured value of the capacitor will be significantly affected. And when we pass this point, it will actually be an inductor. A real inductor is actually an ideal inductor with some parasitic capacitance and some resistance in there. The same is true when the inductive reactance of the ideal inductor becomes equal to the capacitive reactance of the parasitic capacitance. And when we pass this point, our inductor will be capacitive. To avoid all of this, we choose to measure the values of capacitors and inductors at lower frequencies where these parasitic aspects of the real components will not affect our measurement. Now, there may be times when we need to measure the impedance of a particular thing, let's say like an antenna, at a specific frequency. This then dictates the measurement frequency. Now we have to consider how we're going to calibrate the nano VNA so that we can make this measurement as accurately as possible. For best accuracy, we must calibrate the VNA as close to where the item to be measured is going to be connected as possible. Now, here's an important piece of terminology that you will hear in the VNA world. They talk about the reference plane. The reference plane is the physical surface where the faces of the mating connectors meet with the calibration standard. Now, I bring this up because I'm going to refer to it a bit later. Now, getting back to the setup and process of VNA calibration. How and where you calibrate your VNA will depend entirely on what calibration standards you have to work with. You can drop thousands of dollars on precision high-end standards, but this might be way overkill for most things that the average experimenter might do. These high-end standards come with a list of characteristics which do indeed make a noticeable difference at higher frequencies. The higher the frequency, the more difference they will make. The Nano VNA Saver program will allow you to enter these characteristics into the calibration data so you can take advantage of them. Here are the standards that I generally work with when using my Nano VNA. My Nano VNA came with some male SMA standards, which pretty much require me to calibrate right at the port itself. I also have procured some N-type calibration standards. This one has a short standard at one end and an open standard at the other. There is the load and the through. Now, the through is nothing more than a female-to-female -female adapter, a good quality one. These allow me to calibrate my VNA at the end of a cable that has N-type connectors. Now, I have a fixture that I use for loose components, which is just an end connector with some clips attached to it. To perform my VNA calibration using this fixture, I have to use this not so standard but adequate short standard of a piece of wire and a non-inductive high precision resistor for the load standard. My open standard is just not connecting anything to the clips. Now, they're not perfect standards, but they do work fine for anything that I'm doing at the frequencies that I'm doing them. So what do you do if you only have SMA standards 
and you have to add an adapter to accommodate the item to be tested. Case in point, I have this inductor on an end conductor. Now I need to go through this lovely cable to an adapter so I can connect my inductor. Now as long as the cables and adapters are all of the 50 ohm variety, we can use what's called a port extension to move the reference plane from where we did the calibration at the VNA port to the reference plane of the adapter. This method will not work with my clip fixture because the clip fixture is not at all a 50 ohm device. I have to calibrate the VNA at the end of the clips with my not so standard standards to use this. Without this port extension, you will experience significant and serious errors in measurement. I will show you how to add this port extension in this video a little bit later, so stay tuned. The kind of calibration we're interested in for measuring component values is S11. What this means is that the VNA sends out a signal from port 1 and is looking for a signal coming back at port 1. This can also be referred to as reflection, return loss, or other terms depending on the particular VNA that you're working with. In some circles, this calibration is also referred to as SOL calibration, which stands for short, open, load. There's also SOLT, which is a two-port calibration, short, open, load, and through. Your VNA may not report the component value. It may only report the impedance that it sees, and you have to calculate the value from the frequency in the reported reactive value. In the case of the nano VNA and using the VNA saver application, it reports the component value. I'm going to choose a frequency of 50 megahertz to measure my component values at. I will set my start frequency to 40 megahertz and my stop frequency to 60 megahertz. I will choose 11 segments so I get a smoother trace to work with. I will calibrate my VNA at the end of this lovely blue cable with the N connector on the end using my N calibration standards so that I can measure the inductance value of this yellow inductor and connector combination. Well, you know, we actually don't know the value of this inductor because we wound it ourselves out of some 16 gauge wire and a pencil. And with that said, if I put all the coil characteristics like the wire diameter and winding length and winding diameter and all of that into the standard single layer coil winding formula, we can expect a value somewhere around 85 nanohenries. Well, let's see how close we actually got to this value. I'm not going to bore you to watch the entire calibration process. We will click on Calibrate, and then the Calibration Assistant, and then follow the directions on the screen when we get to where we have completed the short open and load, we will choose to click on apply because we have everything we need at that point. Let's leave the load on for a moment when we are done just so that we can do a sanity check. Calibration is complete. We close the calibration window. The load is still on the end of the cable. We'll do a quick sweep and verify that the reported impedance is 50 ohms plus or minus some small J value. We take a look here, we see 50 plus J, 155 milli ohms. So that looks good, our sanity check passes. Now I'm going to remove the load standard and replace it with the inductor on the connector. We sweep and then we read the series L value because we are measuring an inductor.
we look at the marker which resides at 50 megahertz and we read 86.173 nanohenries. Wow, I didn't expect it to be that close to the calculated value. But what about this variable inductor? I have no data sheet on it at all. We have no information to go on. Let's see what these are with the core fully pulled out. At 50 megahertz, it says that it's 197.82 nanohenries. But this is a variable inductor, and we need to know what its maximum inductance is going to be. So just for giggles, I'm going to put the core fully in and see what that maximum inductance would be. So looking at the series L, we see 419.05 nanohenries. We do not have components mounted on connectors very often that we might want to know the value of. What about these loose components? To do this, I will use my fancy precision uh, fixture here. First, we will have to recalibrate the VNA using my ever so non-standard standards. I'll leave the clips open for the open standard. I have my short number 16 wire for the short, and I have my non-inductive precision 50 ohm resistor for my load. I am going to reset the calibration, and I will go to the calibration assistant. I left the load on, and we'll do our sanity check here. At 50 megahertz, we have 50 minus J22.2 milliohms, so my sanity check works. So with calibration complete and verified, we can stick our loose component in the jaws. Well, let's start with this variable inductor. It is the same kind of inductor as I have mounted on the connector. It's just loose. So we should get a similar value. Like before, it has the core all the way out of the coil. And it reads 192. 3.5 nanohenries at 50 megahertz. We measured its cousin, which is mounted on the connector at 197.82 nanohenries. The additional inductance is probably in part contributed by the connector itself. And well, it is also a different device with its own value tolerances too. Well, let's try this glob of a capacitor combination. It's a combination of a 680 picofarad and a 27 picofarad capacitor in parallel. Each has a tolerance of 10%. So we can expect a value mm, somewhere between 636.3 picofarads and 777.7 picofarads. And so what do we read for a value of this capacitor glob? Take a look at series C in the 50 megahertz. And we see 655.87 picofarads. Well, that's certainly between 636 and 777. 
well, you know, all of this is really cool. But I did say something about this whole port extension thing. What about that? So now what about the situation where all I have are my SMA standards? Well, I hate to break the news to you, but this means that the clip fixture that I was just using to measure those loose components won't work for you. You are relegated to make your measurements at the end of a 50 ohm cable and connectors. Our first step is to set our various sweep parameters. I'm going to leave mine as they are at a start frequency of 40 megahertz, a stop frequency of 60 megahertz, and segments at 11. Then we calibrate the VNA at the port connector using our calibration standards. Calibration is complete. I left my 50 ohm standard on here so we could do our sanity check. And we read 50 plus J 5.16 milli ohms. So our sanity check is good. Now we're going to connect our cable with the adapter on the end of it. With the cable all connected, we're going to leave the end open on this, and we're going to sweep that assembly as is. Now we are ready to apply the port extension. We click on the calibration button, and notice here we have the section, the calibrate section. There's an offset delay. It's set for zero picoseconds. That's the default. Now, notice the S11 phase number right here. It's minus 56.5 degrees. The object here is to find a number to enter into this offset delay field that causes the S11 phase to become zero. See, if this number is negative, then you put a negative number in here. If this number is a positive, you put a positive number in here. You can estimate this to get a number close to where you need to be using the following formula. So you measure the length of the cable with its connectors and multiply this by 1 times 10 to the 12th. And you divide this by the speed of light times a guess of the velocity factor of the cable, maybe 0.66. My cable is 12 inches or 30.48 centimeters long with its connectors. I use 11,802.85 mega inches per second for the speed of light. And, you know, a velocity factor of 0.66. And this gives me a starting place of minus 1,540 picoseconds. Well, let's see where this gets us. If we take a peek over here at the S11 phase, we'll see I'm still negative a little bit, minus 1.06. So that's pretty close, but not close enough. I'm looking to make this zero. So I'm going to play with some numbers just a little bit here. I'm not going to bore you to watch me do this. So as you can see here, the number I arrived at was minus 1,569.7 picoseconds. And see here, S11 phase is 0, 0.00. Now we are ready to measure one of our inductors on their connector. Well, let's try this yellow one. And what did we get? We got an inductance of 
0.27 nanohenries. Now, when we measured that, when we calibrated at the end of the cable, we got 86.173 nanohenries. So this new value of 87.827 was within 2% of the value that we measured out here when we were calibrated at this point. So you can see how this helps us, and we can still get reasonably accurate measurements of a component at the end of the cable and everything. Well, what about our handy-dandy antenna analyzer? I'm going to use this MFJ259C to measure three different things. An unknown impedance, an 82 picofarad 5% disk capacitor, and a variable inductor. Now, we're told that it can do these things, but they also say in their manual, the MFJ259 becomes inaccurate when measuring reactants below 7 ohms or above 650 ohms. Now, I will compare the MFJ measured values to the values I measured using my VNA to determine the accuracy of the MFJ antenna analyzer when measuring impedances. So the first thing that I will do is measure my test load, which is a purposely non-perfect load containing resistive, inductive, and capacitive elements. I have carefully set things up so that the MFJ259 will be measuring exactly what the VNA measures, so we will be comparing apples to apples here. So how did the MFJ results compare to the VNA results? Well, not very well. Skipping all of the real and reactive comparisons, I'll just go to the magnitude of impedance and compare these. At 50 megahertz, the MFJ differed from the VNA by plus 56.7%. At 100 megahertz, it differed by minus 15.3%. And finally, at 200 megahertz, it differed by 1,335.5%. So let's try a couple simpler examples. The first one will be an 82 picofarad 5% ceramic disc capacitor, which I will carefully measure at 50 megahertz with my VNA, and then with my MFJ antenna analyzer. The VNA reports the value of this capacitor at 80.999 picofarads. I connected the capacitor to my MFJ, doing my very best to keep the capacitor at the reference plane of the antenna analyzer, as you can see here. The MFJ reported the value of the capacitor as 89 picofarads. Now, this differs from the VNA measured value by 9.88%. The second one will be one of my variable inductors with a core pulled all the way out. The VNA reports the value of this inductor at 177.42 nanohenries. I connected this inductor to the MFJ in a similar way as I did the capacitor, being very careful to maintain the inductor's connection at the reference plane of the antenna analyzer. The MFJ reported the value of the inductor as 252 nanohenries at 50 megahertz. This differs from the VNA measured value by 42%. Well, what about other antenna analyzers like the Rig Expert? Well, I was able to borrow a Rig Expert AA600 from a fellow ham here in Dubuque so I could do a quick check on it. So, how did it do? Well, much better than the MFJ259. As compared to measurements made with my high-end Tektronix VNA using high-end calibration standards, it measured the impedance of the test load at 50 MHz within 0.1%, at 100 MHz within 8.5%, and at 200 MHz within 121%. It measured the inductance of my test inductors at 50 MHz within 10% and the capacitance of my 82 picofarad disc ceramic capacitor within 10% as compared to the same measurement made with my Tektronix VNA. As a result of this and other such experiments, I will always defer to my VNA for making impedance, capacitance, and inductance measurements. This might be my nano VNA, 
my Mini VNA Tiny, or my higher-end Tektronix VNA. If you are going to be doing any kind of fun stuff requiring measuring impedances or capacitor or inductor values, then I highly advise investing in one of these VNAs. Well, now you know how to go about using the Nano VNA to measure components like capacitors and inductors and even other impedances. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.